Traders Library is proud to present the Trade Secrets video series, taped live at industry seminars. Featuring the top names in trading, these instructional tapes provide key insights into the world of trading. The first of its kind, this exciting series is supported by additional educational material, including charts, manuals, and other visual aids to help you advance your trading skills. The Trade Secrets video series is a truly comprehensive series for traders, featuring top traders like best-selling options trading author Larry McMillan, whose video The Volatility Primer was hailed by Stocks and Commodities magazine as jam-packed with useful information. This insider's guide to the intricacies of options pricing will benefit novice and experienced traders alike. MarketWise Trading School founder and best-selling author David S. Nasser, who wrote How to Get Started in Electronic Day Trading, one of the first Bibles of the short-term trading world. Nasser's short-term trading course will help you discover new and innovative techniques that fly in the face of accepted market wisdom. Options Industry Council's top instructor, James Bittman, as he outlines which option strategies are best suited to increase profitability when dealing with breakout, range-bound, or trending stocks in picking the best stocks and strategies for every option trade. Steve Nissen and his strategies for profiting with Japanese candlesticks video, providing an in-depth step-by-step course for applying this powerful and popular charting technique. For more information on the Trade Secrets video series or any of our additional investment-focused products, visit our website today at www.traderslibrary.com or call 1-800-272-2855. Traders Library, your number one source for great everyday low prices. Bernie Schaefer, CEO of Schaefer's Investment Research, presents the 10 Most Powerful Option Trading Secrets. Join this year's Traders Hall of Fame recipient and discover the world of options as he illustrates powerful strategies for picking stocks and trading options. I'd like to, I'd like to pose three questions. And I'd like you to individually record your responses to those questions. And rather than deal with uh, my responses to them, we're going to, uh, as we get through this presentation, we're going to deal with each of those individual questions and uh, we'll spend some time uh, because these questions really center on some of the uh, more important uh, factors to understand if you're going to be successful at buying calls and buying puts. So, I'll start with question number one. Do the most volatile stocks offer the biggest profit potential for option buyers? Do the most volatile stocks offer the biggest profit potential for option buyers? Second question is for the option buyer, is buying a on the money option with two weeks to go until expiration? a riskier trade than buying a two-month on-the-money option because the two-week option is undergoing accelerated time decay. Okay. And question number three, if I buy a stock at 100, is it, is it as likely to be in one year 150 as it is likely to be 50? Buy a stock at 100, a year from now, is that stock as likely to be at 150 as it is likely to be at 50? Are those probabilities about the same? And we will, we will deal with each of those questions uh, in some depth as we, as we move along here. When I say naked option buying is deceptively simple, probably uh, number one that comes to mind to me is 
that to be successful at naked option buying, you need to have a price forecast over a specific time period. A price forecast over a specific time period. Now, in the execution, it's not just sufficient to have a forecast. You have to have some kind of an edge at forecasting that directional move. Not only do you have to have an edge in forecasting the directional move over a specific time period, you also have to be forecasting the magnitude of that move, because the magnitude of that move is critical, as we will come to, particularly when you are dealing with the more volatile stocks in the universe for which you are paying higher option premiums. And we're going to get to a little, a little acronym here that I used, FAR. If you're an option buyer, you need what I call a fast, aggressive move in the right direction. And what that comes down to is the option over the course of, of the uh, uh, life of that option has to make a big move in your predicted direction. And by what do I mean by big? A lot of that depends on the premium that you're, that you're paying to begin with. More on that we will come to. Two of the major pitfalls that invariably uh, occur, particularly with those who are moving from the stock world to the options world, is number one, a general overcommitment of capital to options trading. And number two, within the capital that's devoted to options trading, lack of diversification. And this lack of diversification often is in, 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 in two, has two aspects to it. Number one, lack of stock-by-stock -stock diversification, and there also tends to be a lack of diversification uh, between bullish bets on the call side and bearish bets on the put side. Nice world, the stock world. Uh, time is, is on your side in terms of the long-term upward bias of the market. And as a result of that, your timing can be sloppy. Uh, you can experience a big move against you for a fairly long period of time and ultimately be bailed out by the market. It's not... Uh, it's not an approach that needs to be. It certainly helps if there is discipline associated with the approach. But it's not, it's not a, 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 an approach that absolutely requires discipline. In the options world, you're constantly battling time decay as an options buyer. And when I say options world, I'm talking about uh, naked call buying and naked put buying. And your timing is critical. You have a time-sensitive, decaying asset. Uh, matter of fact, options buying is really the only endeavor where speed of movement is critical to your profitability. Even if you're an in and out, even if you're an in and out rapid stock trader, uh, you can afford a little bit of uh, leeway with regard to time. Uh, it's more in terms of the opportunity cost when you're trading stocks in terms of how fast you can turn over those, those gains. In options, it's more than opportunity cost. It's the fact that the asset that you own is deteriorating with each passing day. Now, when I put this, when I put this particular slide together, uh, I had already revised down this, this has already been revised now, this 6% premium for uh, a three-month on-the-money option. Uh, I, was, I was just plugging in at that point a 30%, roughly 30% implied volatility. And a 30% implied volatility translates into roughly a 6% premium for a three-month on-the-money option on a non-dividend paying stock. Probably, if I was going to redo that, this slide right here and now, 4% might be 
closer, or maybe 5%, somewhere between 4 and 5% might be closer to the typical answer as to what a on-the-money option with three months to go until expiration will be selling for. And essentially that relates to the steady decline as, as you can see in a chart for the overall market of the VIX or the VXO or the VXN, the steady decline in implied volatilities that has occurred over the past couple of years. And just thinking in terms of, let's, let's say this number of 6% is, is 4%, stock with a 20% implied volatility. Essentially what you're talking about is if you get an 8% move in your direction over the 90 days, you're doubling, you're doubling your money. So the bar is constantly, with regard to the leverage that, that you can achieve in options trading, the bar has been consistently lowered uh, in recent years. Now you can say, well, yeah, the market's been in a tight rating tra trading range and volatility ha has actually been, been lower, so it's a, it's, a, it's a tougher game in general to uh, get your move. And to some extent that's true. On the other hand, we've been in kind of a, a stock picker's market environment, and if you, get, if you get out of the index world into the world of individual stocks, there have been many stocks whose options have been priced very modestly relative to what you might have had to pay for those options two, three, four years ago that have made very significant moves. When Google options first started trading, they were in the neighborhood of where Yahoo options were, which was in that 40% implied volatility zone. Well, stock made a huge move, and now those volatilities, I believe, at, at one point got to 60, 65%, or perhaps even more. But the point was, we were in, that, we were in this uh, sleepy market environment. Uh, a lot of the strategies... When, when Google Options began trading, I mean, it was obvious. You took a look at the, the open interest as it was accumulating. It was obvious that the most popular strategy, if you recall, uh, the IPO price on Google was 85. Started trading at about 95, 97, and then spent quite a bit of time in that 100 to 110 range. If you took a look at what was going on with the options, number one, the implied volatilities were not very aggressive as I said, in that 40% zone. And number two, you take a look at the open interest at the various call strikes, particularly 105, 110. I think 110 is the one that, that, that really resounded. And you can see that the, the beginning of options trading on Google was looked at mostly as an opportunity to sell calls against stock owned. Hey, I just bought, I just bought some Google here. Let me get some additional income because, hey, 110, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty big move to occur by September or October. And, and we're, we're going to get into a little bit of this when I discuss some of, the, some of the pitfalls of the more conservative strategies, such as covered writing. And I'm sure you can appreciate uh, how somebody is... Uh, literally and perhaps literally and figuratively looking out the window when they've sold a 110 call against the stock that they purchased at say 100 and that stock moves to 200. And guess what? After it moved to 200, that's when the implieds took off. But this is an exceptional situation. In general, you're in a situation, you're in kind of a, you still in kind of a sleepy environment. You're still in an environment where uh, Call selling, premium selling in general, uh, is still uh, uh, growing as a as a uh, as the strategy that is. Well, let's put it this way: is, is a strategy that is probably initiating uh, many much greater percentage of option trades uh, than it ever has. There's no question that it's initiating a lot a lot more options trades than it ever has, and that obviously contributes. Uh, to, this, to this compression in premium. Well, there's opportunity associated with that compression in premium uh, in terms of the, uh, not only in terms of leverage, not only in terms of leverage, and a 
preempt myself a little bit here in terms of what we're going to discuss later, but 6% premium on a three-month out-of-the-money, on-the-money option. Take a stock at $50 a share. So that option is going to be uh, trading at three points. You're going to pay three points for that uh, three months of time on that, uh, let's, call, let's say it's a call option. Um, Break-even point, 53. 50 plus the premium for the on-the-money option. What happens if we're talking a 4% premium on an on-the-money option? Well, now your break-even point has gone from 53 to 52. And yes, if you move to 60, if you paid three, you're going to you're going to get back a little more than three times your investment. But if you only pay two, you're going to get five times your investment back. But also understand, and this is this is something that comes up in particular from my standpoint when you're talking these extremely high premium options. That hurdle, that break-even point, also becomes a much gentler uh, obstacle to overcome when these premiums come in. Flexibility, yeah. Calls and puts, strike prices, expiration months. Uh, this relates to, number one, what I had said a little bit earlier in, in terms of a lot of options traders do not take full advantage of the fact that they can buy calls and puts, the fact that they don't have to be quite as aggressive as their original gut feeling is as far as uh, strike price is concerned. They don't necessarily have to buy as little time as there's, they, they have a tendency to do. Uh, so I, I think in general, this flexibility factor is there for the taking, but a lot of traders don't take full advantage of it. Limited dollar risk. Limited dollar risk is nice, but back to the point I was making earlier, one of the, one of the big pitfalls being an overcommitment of capital. Now, clearly, if you're talking about a situation where uh, you can only lose your, your original investment, I mean, how many people would, would put a substantial amount of money in a stock if they had an idea that they could potentially 50-50 lose their complete investment? A lot of people do that with options. A lot of people do that at options. What, whether it's because they're blinded by what the upside potential might be, or whether it's our general tendency as uh, human beings to overestimate our ability to forecast. Uh, and you, you take that with the fact that generally people don't buy enough time, and generally people go too far out of the money and that's where a lot of people get in trouble. Now there is a point, believe it or not, when you think in terms of the Peter Lynch's or the Warren Buffett's, there is something to relate in terms of what these gentlemen do to what we're trying to accomplish in terms of buying options. Because they're in it for the long haul and it doesn't phase them in the least when their money doubles, triples, quadruples. Peter Lynch in his book talks about 10 baggers, stocks that end up being worth 10 times what he originally paid for them. They are actually doing on a much longer term scale what we're trying to do when we're trading, when we're buying calls and we're buying puts. We're, we, we, we want to maximize our chance to get those 10 baggers. And if we do, we can afford to be wrong on a reasonably large percentage of our trades and still come out very much ahead. And Lynch has been wrong. Buffett, there are some many investments, U.S. Air being one that comes to mind where I believe he lost more than half his investment, but then if you, you know, take a look at uh, the hundreds and hundreds of percent he's ahead on some of his longer term holdings, the balance is strongly towards a profitable bottom line. This is a long only approach, obviously, and is very often based in fundamentals, which is fine 
because you don't have the time constraints associated with it. And so your entry point doesn't become critical. As a matter of fact, particularly if you're a big fund manager, you can essentially be accumulating a position over time. Now, when you get into the world of stock trading and you, you look at some of, these, some of these names here, now you're in the, instead of in that 10-bagger world, don't worry about it, I'll have some, I'll have some big losses, but, but I'm going to make up for it by, by having 10 baggers. I mean, these people who are traders have a much shorter time frame. So they're in the business of cutting their losses, letting their profits run. And in a sense, in a sense, I'd rather be, if I'm trading for the shorter term, I'd rather be trading in the options world because it puts me in the 10-bagger world on a much more condensed time frame. If I'm trading stocks for the short term, I'm really, I'm really looking for profits, but not huge profits. And I'm looking to have losses that are much smaller than the profits that I'm, take, that I'm taking off the table. Long and short, if you're a stock trader, and pretty tough to be a short-term trader without some kind of a technical approach that helps you as far as timing your entry points is concerned. Now this sounds pretty daunting. You gotta be a good stock picker, your timing has to be a precision timing and you have to have extreme discipline. And I think I could, perhaps I could, I could give you another perspective on it as far as uh, being successful at buying options. And that would be you must have a directional edge over defined time periods. If you have an approach that gives you some kind of an edge in terms of, of being able to call direction and being able in particular to call big moves, not 100% of the time, doesn't have to be 50% of the time, but enough of the time that you can achieve some of these huge profits uh, that are achievable on moves that aren't necessarily that huge in the underlying stock. Remember a little while ago, we talked about making three, four, five times your money on uh, a 20% move in a stock over a, a three-month period of time. But you have to be able to put yourself in that game enough to offset the inevitable losses. This is a strategy that, I mean, I feel like I understand the strategy as, as well as the next guy. This is a strategy that has kind of mystified me over the years in terms of how popular it is, how popular it, it, it has become, and I think it's more popular now than ever. Uh, maybe not in this room, but, but it is an extremely popular strategy. And I just have never, I think part of the reason, and I know we've moved away from, from uh, uh, dealing with brokers over the phone to a large extent, but I think part of the reason is the brokerage community, which was very heavily involved uh, in, in, uh, in options trading going back, let's say, 10, 12, 15 years, this was a strategy that, number one, was very easy to explain, and number two, uh, was considered to be much more acceptable, let's say, by their compliance departments, by their uh, top management, than people going around speculating, buying calls, buying puts, or selling naked options, uh, getting in trouble like they did in 1987. Uh, but here's a strategy where if you have a roaring bull market, you're not going to participate. If you have a uh, horrible bear market, you're going to lose just as much as the next guy minus the premium that you capture for the option. Uh, it just doesn't strike me as a, a reward risk equation that makes a heck of a lot of sense. Now, that said, CBOE has an index, covered call buying index, that basically robotically sells calls against stock owned, and over the years, I believe that index has performed about in line with the market averages with a bit less 
risk associated with it. So I guess theoretically, theoretically, it, is, it has been a relatively successful strategy, and I guess that would explain in, in part some of, its, some of its popularity. On the other hand, I don't believe we've gone through uh, all the different kinds of market environments that you could potentially go through. For example, probably the biggest nightmare right here and right now for the covered writing strategy would be a major market decline from here. And one of the reasons it would be such a nightmare is the premiums that are being captured right now are extremely modest. Back to the Google example I gave. I mean, selling for a 40% implied, selling 110 strike call for four or five points with the stock trading somewhere between 100 and 105. Uh, what's that going to do for you if Google would have plunged to 40 or 50 like so many people were predicting not much. It's not going to help ease the pain of the loss very much. But I guarantee you that the pain that people are experiencing who sold those options and saw that stock run to 200, this opportunity, this opportunity cost, I mean, usually, usually it's, it's, it's the pain of actually taking losses is, is said to be greater than the pain of opportunity lost. I don't know if that would be the case in this particular situation, where you see a stock, where you cap your, where you essentially cap your price appreciation to 110 plus the premium you're collecting and a, and a stock runs to 200. So again, uh, covered call writing, if you're not confident in your stock picking ability, I think many will gravitate to a strategy like this if they're not confident in their stock picking ability. Because, hey, you know, I'm not going for a home run and I want a little bit of protection in case I'm wrong, et cetera. I have trouble with it. It has a track record. But I just, the purpose in, the, in, in this context is, is to just illustrate some of the pitfalls that are associated with the, the, the so called safer strategies. And we're not going to spend, we're going to spend a lot more time on the. Uh, on the profile of the uh, option buying, let's move on. Naked put selling. Naked put selling is essentially the same strategy in terms of the profit and loss curve as covered call buying. And I guess I would say the same thing in terms of naked put selling. If you had sold uh, a uh, put on Google, uh, with the stock at 100 at a very modest premium. Uh, you look at the stock moving to 150 $175, $200 a share. Yes, you've captured your eight bucks. Uh, and again, should the stock plunge, you have some protection in terms of the premium that you capture, and, and, and you're able to buy the stock. If, you're, if the stock is put to you, you're able to buy the stock at a discount to what the stock was when you sold the option. And I think that's another, uh, a, a, a little bit of a, uh, of a uh, misunderstanding, perhaps, with regard to the, the sales story on put selling. The sales story on put selling, let's say you have a stock at 100. You sell a put for eight points. And, well, what's the downside? Well, worst that could happen is, you're buying the stock for 92. You're buying the stock for 100 less the premium that you're receiving for the put. That's nice. If the stock is 50, you don't want to be buying it for 92. So it depends on what your, what your point of reference is. Again, we do some put selling. Nothing wrong with doing some put selling. Again, this is just comparing and contrasting some strategies that have Comparing and contrasting some strategies that have uh, kind of been uh, uh, I think unfairly uh, lionized in terms of their reward and risk. Same profile, uh, put selling, the red line is at expiration. Your profit of course is, is, is fully realized with the stock above the strike and then 
your loss is the same as a stockholder's loss, except you have to deduct the premium that you received. One thing is ni that's nice and clean to say about naked option buying, buying calls and buying puts, is yes, you can lose your entire investment, but your profit is open-ended. On puts, yeah, stock can't go below zero, but for all intents and purposes, your profit is open-ended. Now, what if I were to propose a strategy to you where I said, you can lose 100% of your investment, but your profit is capped? You might say, no, thank you. Um, now, yes, is that a simplistic way of presenting uh, a vertical debit spread? Sure. Sure. But this is essentially the strategy that you're getting involved in. You're buying a particular, use calls again, you're buying a particular call, you're selling a further out of the money call, you're reducing your initial outlay. Sometimes that can be kind of attractive, particularly if you're talking uh, a crazy situation where biotech company has got a 100% implied on its options and you're bullish, but you certainly don't want to pay that, so you'll sell an option against a, an, an option that you buy and you'll not take most of the pain out of the premium that you're paying because you're, you're selling premium against long premium. So there, there are, again, there are some situations where it makes sense, particularly, probably particularly on the put side, where out of the money puts tend to sell for higher implieds than on the money puts. So that could make sense in terms of you're capturing a, uh, a bigger vol in the options that you're selling than, than the options that you're buying. But number one, be advised that you are setting yourself up for potential total loss and you're capping by selling the out of the money. The Google example, let's say you bought a call with 100 strike and you sold a call with 110 strike. And you, you, you might have gotten your, your initial, let's say the stock was 103, your, your initial outlay then might only be instead of 10 points for the 100 strike, you're selling the 110 against it, your initial outlay might have only been four points. So now if the stock goes to 110, your outlay is four, you're making money with that, with that vertical spread. If you bought the option for the 100 strike, let's say, for 10, and the stock goes to 110 by expiration, you're not making any money. So there are certainly points between the strikes where, where, where you can do a lot better by having sold the, the, uh, the out-of-the-money call. Everybody with me on the, on the vertical spreads? Anybody not with me? Because I'm not going to spend a heck of a lot of time on it. I'm just trying to point out some of the, some of the uh, uh, what I would consider to be pitfalls. And one more thing. A lot of verbiage here. Profits on a major move in the stock that occurs quickly can't be fully captured due to the remaining time premium on the short option. This can often result in missed opportunities to take profits in major options. Basically what I'm saying is, if you, if you, back to Google, if you buy an option at a, uh, the call option at 100 strike, you sell the 110 strike against it, and Google goes to 140 immediately, and let's say you're selling January, you've got a big fat chunk of premium remaining in the option that you sold. So now you don't know quite what to do. Do I sit there and wait for the premium to dissipate? Well, wait a minute now. I'm not, I was in this strategy because I was bullish on Google. I wasn't in this strategy to sit there and twiddle my thumbs while the premium is coming in. So it presents you with, with a unique set of problems when you're very right very quickly. Remember, fast, aggressive move in the right direction. Well, if you get that and you're doing a vertical uh, debit spread, you're kind of discombobulated. You don't quite know what to do. It doesn't seem, seem right that a stock is 140. I, I basically, uh, I'm basically involved in a 10-point interval between 100 and 110. I should be getting my 10 points. And instead, I'm only getting seven points. So now what do I do? 
Do I want to just sit there and, 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 and wait for expiration to get my three points? Do I get out then? Uh, am I happy if I get out then? Again, not insurmountable uh, problems. And yes, between 100 and 110, I'm a little bit better off. I'm more than a little bit better off uh, by having sold uh, the, the out of the money against, against the 100 strike. But again, basic to the core, what I'm talking about here is unlimited loss potential and you're capping your profits. Let me go move back. So the curve the curve and we're at expiration on the red on the red line. The curve instead of going up here goes out here as far as when when, when you when you're correct. There was a fascinating article in uh, the Financial Times, November 6th. What's that? Last Friday? Fascinating article about a new, by, a new book by a gentleman by the name of Benoit Mandelbrot. Anybody familiar with that? Fractal, the father of fractal geometry. And he wrote a book. I didn't jot the title down. But this, this is not, and this is not necessarily a quote. This is the book reviewer's uh, uh, interpretation of, of one of the central points of, uh, of, of uh, what Mandelbrot is making in this new book. And I'll, I'll indulge me here while I read it. Benoit Mandelbrot, celebrated mathematician and inventor of fractal geometry in his new book, and I'm quoting, and this is more of a paraphrase than a quote. The most important failing of conventional price change models is they grossly underestimate the frequency of extreme events. In the currency and stock markets over the past few years, there have been rises and falls too large to have been expected according to the conventional Gaussian distribution of the bell curve even if the markets had been trading since the Big Bang 15 billion years ago. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. That is, to, in this gentleman's view, mathematician and father of fractal geometry, uh, there are some events that occurred during the course of currency trading and stock market trading in recent years that couldn't be explained according to the conventional bell-shaped type distribution of returns that is underlying most of the pricing models, even if the markets have been trading since the beginning of time. And the seductiveness of selling naked premium uh, particularly if you have no intention or capability of taking delivery. Okay, let's say we want to, we want to try to get some 10 baggers and, and, and profit from buying calls and buying puts. What might be a good backdrop for initiating a call buying trade or a put buying trade? Uh, Earnings are always, in, 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 in my estimation, uh, very interesting potential catalysts for options trades. Now, if you're buying an option, excuse me, the, the day of, let's say earnings are being reported after the close, you're buying it the day of the earnings or a few days before, whatever, a lot of it depends on, don't have the uh, uh, opportunity to get into that much detail on it, but a lot of it depends on what the implicit forecast is of the options as far as what move is expected, what post-earnings move is expected. Bottom line is the implied volatilities are going to increase significantly on those options because everybody knows that there is a potentially major stock-moving event that is about to occur. Now sometimes it is, particularly in these times, it is shocking even ahead of earnings, it is shocking how, how 
little of the implieds move up. So the pre-earnings announcement opportunity, I think, is much more attractive than it ever has been. One quick example was Microsoft. Ahead of its most uh, recent report, you could have bought December, December calls, December out of the money calls, and December out of the money puts, puts being a little bit more expensive, for about a 28% implied. Now, I guarantee you, if you, if you move back to the, the days of the bubble, um, you'd probably be paying, I was going to say twice that much. I, I'll bet you you'd be paying two and a half, three times that much in, in certain instances, uh, uh, even with a stock like Microsoft. So again, uh, and, I, and I think part of this is there's such a desire to sell premium, to get a little bit of incremental return, when those volatilities move up pre-earnings, there are sellers in there ready to jump all over it and sell. So there are consequent now, P.S., the Microsoft move did not turn out to be particularly huge. It looked promising for the first 24 hours or so, but then it, it, just, kind of, uh, it just kind of dissipated. But that doesn't mean it wasn't an opportunity. That doesn't mean that the options were cheap because the crowd knew that the stock wasn't going to move. The option was cheap because, in general, there is a predominance of premium selling going on in a, in a backdrop of continuing declining implied volatility, and it's a feedback process. The more premium is sold, the more implieds decline, and it, it, it just continues until it stops. And it might stop in a very discontinuous, disorderly fashion. Now, you can go after an earnings announcement. Uh, after an earnings announcement, the implied volatilities will come in. And one thing I've noticed with the implies after an earnings announcement is they will start out the day, they'll be at a discount to what they were before the earnings because now the event is known. They'll start out the day, though, at a particular level, and they will tend to decline almost before your eyes over the course of the day. So by the time you get halfway through that day, the implies could be... Uh, even much more attractive than they were at the beginning of the day. But the point is, in my opinion, you still have, after an earnings announcement, you're still in a much more volatile, unstable state in a stock than you are months before an earnings announcement, in, in between uh, earnings reporting, where earnings aren't really a factor. You're still you're still in a situation where, as an option buyer, there's a little bit extra, maybe more than a little bit extra, <clears throat> excuse me, opportunity to make money uh, because the stock may not, even though it might have gapped in a particular direction, it still may not have found its level. Maybe the move is going to continue in the direction it gapped. Maybe the move is going to, is going to uh, go back towards the mean, but the point is I still think there is more opportunity in those kinds of situations uh, to make money uh, than in a non-earnings based kind of situation. Major sentiment imbalance. What am I talking about there being a major sentiment imbalance? If you have a situation, and, and again, I'm going to have to qualify this because a lot of the uh, open interest that, has, that accumulates in the various call and put options these days is based, is based on uh, seller-initiated transactions. But let's, let's assume that you have huge put open interest at a particular strike. Let's say Google, that's a decent example, let's say Google is trading at 105 and it's got some pretty significant put open interest that has built up at the 100 strike. Now, if that put open interest is buyer initiated, that means, that means the seller of those options is short puts. And it means the seller of those options, if they want to hedge their exposure, is going to short some stock. And essentially, 
you can say that there's heavy buyer-generated put open interest at a particular strike. To some extent, that stock has been pre-shorted by those who are hedging their exposure. And what happens should that stock start to rally? That stock starts to rally, the hedge, the short position for those who are short the puts becomes less of a need. As the stock moves further and further from the strike price, the hedging needs on the short side become less and less. So short positions will start to get lifted and you could start to get into an acceleration to the upside. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Another factor that also helps when you have, again, big buyer-generated put open interest at a, at a strike, let's say, below the current stock price, is let's say we start moving in the other direction. Let's say Google starts going 105, 103, 102, 101. What starts to happen there is those who are long the puts are going to start to take some profits. And if they start to take some profits, that means some of those puts come off the table. And that means the short hedges are, 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 are coming off the table. And that provides a measure of support for the stock on the downside. So you get a measure of support for the stock on the downside. And you get a potential acceleration to the upside as those hedges are unwound. Now, what's the, what's the risk? The risk is if the stock mo starts moving below the strike and continues to go move down, you're going to have some urgent hedging needs that start to develop. As those puts become more and more in the money, there's more and more shorting that needs to go on to hedge the put position. So, you might get an acceleration to the downside if that strike is penetrated. But if you're a call buyer, let's say you're a 100 strike call buyer, you don't much care ultimately whether that stock ends up at 97 or 94 or 82 or 12. You're going to lose your you're going to lose your premium at, at any price below at, at, at 100 or below, regardless of how low it goes. So I wouldn't mind I don't mind taking that accelerated move to the downside risk when I'm buying calls, if I can benefit from short covering, accelerating my move to the upside, or put position covering, providing support for me at the strike. So. And, and this really isn't, isn't a sentiment point. I mean, a, lot, a lot of times we can say, well, heavy put open interest, that means, it means that there's a lot of bearishness, so you want to be a contrarian to that. So, so, so to some extent, that is, that is the case. But the mechanics of the market is what, is what can really benefit you when there's, when there's too, too much of a crowded trade, either on the put side below the market or on the call side above the market. Now, what if this, these transactions are seller-generated for the most part? What happens when these transactions are seller-generated, whether they be on the put side below the market or whether they be on the call side above the market, is it tends to depress, compress, suck the volatility out, whatever you want to call it. In other words, strategies that are implemented to benefit from sideways markets tend to beget more sideways markets. And that's not good. That's not particularly good for, for, any, for anybody who is long stock, long premium, is looking for directional movement. How do you know whether they're sellers or buyers? The question is, how do, I, how do we know whether they're sellers or buyers? I mean, one clue one clue as to whether the sellers are buyers is what's going on, what is the actual level of implied volatility, and in what direction has the implied volatility been going. Uh, and if, if the answer is low and, and declining, there's a, tendency to, there's a tendency for the positions to be generated 
by sellers under, under those circumstances. Another way of looking at it is, I use that Google example with the stock at 110, with the stock at 100 to 105. And I said that 110 strike and to some extent the 105 strike were generating a lot of action in the front month. And those tend to be the kinds of strikes that a covered writer would be attracted to. One or two strikes out of the money off of the, the current price of the stock. Another clue, when you got a big chunk of open interest at a particular strike, another clue that it was seller generated could be if you look at daily volume, and daily volume is fairly light, almost to the point where you say, well, what's, what's going on here? You get this huge open interest and volume is very light probably means that there was a lot of, put, uh, of uh, calls or puts sold at a particular two, three, four, five day interval and then once that's done, nothing much is happening. Generally a sign that, that buyers are active at a particular strike is where you got some pretty decent daily volume going on uh, relative to the open interest. Okay, I mean, you know, you, you know this in terms of the time sensitivity of options. Uh, one way, one way to, uh, another way to refer to it is uh, you're renting price movement, you don't own price movement as an option buyer. Um, it's a battle. It's a battle. And, and what I'm going to feature first in this part of the presentation is the good stuff. The leverage associated with being an option buyer and what is called the convexity factor that's associated with being an option buyer relating to the fact that uh, you can make a lot more money on a given move in the stock than you can lose. I'm going to fo focus on the good guys, so to speak, and then we're going to deal with the time decay factor. Essentially, this battle that I'm talking about is between leverage and convexity on one side and time decay on the other side. Okay, we're going we're gonna to use as our example a 60-day call option and we're talking about a $50 stock and we're talking about an on the money 50 strike call and the premium for this option on the 50 strike call the premium for this option is $1.80 and this translates into an implied volatility of about 23 percent which talk about many, many blue chip stocks these days, it's in the ballpark of what you would see as an implied volatility. And this is a profit and loss graph. I'm sure many, if not most, if not all of you have seen these before. As the stock moves up, this is a, this is a call buying situation. This yellow line represents the loss or profit instantaneously on the day you buy the option. Uh, the the uh, discontinuous red line represents the profit and loss on expiration day. As the stock moves up, you have a profit. As the stock moves down, you have a loss that, that grows. Of course, at expiration, the loss doesn't grow. The loss is equal to the premium that you paid for the option. So the clock starts ticking. We bought that 60-day option for a buck 80 on the $50 stock with a 50 strike. And what we're looking for is a fast, aggressive move in the right direction. We want that speed of movement to, to, to be as, as great as we possibly can. And let's say we hit the jackpot. Let's say we hit the jackpot on day one. Nothing could be faster than that. And let's say the stock moves from 50 
to 54 on day one. That's a pretty aggressive move in one day. So we're getting fast and aggressive, and it's also in the right direction because we bought a call. Okay. So we've got a move in the stock from 50 to 54. That's an 8% move in the stock. And what happens to our option? Well, scale is over here, but this profit is about $3.70. Excuse me, $2.90. Excuse me, sorry. This profit just a shade under three, $2.90 profit. And let's, let's explore that in some more detail. Bought this option with the stock at 50 for $1.80. Fast, aggressive move the same day from 50 to 54, that option is going to be trading roughly at $4.70. It's got four points of intrinsic value and a little bit of time premium uh, as we move away from the strike price, of course, that time premium uh, declines. $4.70 is the current price. We paid $1.80. Our profit is $2.90. $2.90 profit on a $1.80 investment translates into 160% gain. More than double, not quite triple. This gain, the stock, excuse me, the stock moved up four points. That was an 8% gain. We made 160% on the option, 8% on an 8% move in the stock, and that would be 20 to 1 leverage in terms of the profit on the option being 20 times the profit from holding the stock over that same one-day period. Now, there's nothing wrong with that stock actually having moved from 50 to 54 over the course of that 60 days, because at the end of that 60 days, we're going to have about end up with about 15 to 1 leverage because the option is going to trade at four points, its intrinsic value, rather than $4.70. Still pretty good. That's still a fast, aggressive move in the right direction. And what we're looking at is a faster, aggressive move in the right direction because we're looking at, we're looking at hitting the jackpot here. Another way to look at this, beyond just looking at leverage, is the option increased in price by $2.90. The stock increased in price by $4, $2.90, But we had to put up 50 bucks to get the four points on the stock, and we only had to put up $1.80 to get the $2.90 move on the option. That's how good things can look when we get that kind of a move in that short a period of time. Okay. Let's say we got, instead of F-A-R, we got F-A-W, fast, aggressive move in the wrong direction. And the stock goes from 50 to 46 instantaneously. So we're still on that yellow curve here. This is our loss, and this loss is $1.45. This comes from the fact that the option with the stock at 46 has about 35 cents in premium. The stock at 46, we're going to lose $1.45 on our option since we've got 35 cents left and we put up $1.80. So we've got a loss of $1.45. Four points down, we've lost $1.45. Four points up, we made $2.90. And this is what I'm calling the convexity factor. We make twice as much on an instantaneous plus 8% as we lose on an instantaneous minus 8%. That's not bad. Not only are we getting this 20 to 1 leverage, not only are we getting $2.90 out of a four point move. By only putting up a buck eighty instead of fifty, but we're making twice as much on being geniuses 
as we lose by being dummies in the context of what happens on that same day. Now, if this was at expiration, if everything was uh, stretched out to expiration, we took all the uh, premiums out of the option, this two to one convexity factor would become about 1.2. You still get a benefit from not losing as much as you gain on, on, on this kind of a move, but it decreases as you approach expiration. And this is now what we have to deal with. We have to deal with this $1.80 gap between breaking even on day, on day one and losing it all if the stock remains at 50 at expiration. That's the time decay factor that we're battling. And of course, we lose that $1.80 whether the stock is at 50, the stock is at 46, no matter how low the stock goes. And this is our hurdle factor. We have to move from 50 to $51.80 at expiration for, the, for us to break even on the option. If it starts moving right away on that first day, we start making money right away. If we've held that option to expiration, that stock needs to be $51.80 or higher for us to make money, and we lose money in the interval between 50 and 51.80. That's our break-even point. And since we didn't cap our options trade by selling anything against it, we, we essentially have this, this very attractive upside potential. So we know this. Stock is flat or lower at expiration. We lose our entire investment. And we've got to get to the strike price plus the premium in order to break even. Okay, the time decay process. And this is where we're going to get to way back to my question number two, where I talked about two-week options and two-month options. And is buying a two-week riskier than a two-month because we're in accelerated time decay? Obviously... If you're just looking at the passage of time, if you're just looking at the passage of time, 60 days, 59 days, down to day zero, which is your expiration day, that is a linear process. One day at a time passes, and it's kind of a straight line type of a deal. As far as time decay on an on-the-money option, it's not linear. As a matter of fact, for the first 45 days of the life of that option. And bear in mind now, when I'm, when I'm making all these uh, uh, statements and calculations here, I'm assuming the stock is remaining at 50 with each day that passes, just to make it in, in, in as few dimensions as possible so that we can, including myself, uh, follow it through. Uh, until 75, you reach the point where 75% of the time has passed. So at a 60-day option, uh, 45 days have passed. That time decay is actually slower than linear. So if time is passing like this, the decay is going to be a little bit less. And then once you get to that 75% point, in this case 45 days, that decay will start to accelerate. So it's faster than linear after three quarters of the time has passed, and it accelerates into expiration. The percentage of the option premium that you retain at any given point relates to the square root of the time remaining. So for example, if half the time has expired in this 60-day option, 30 days has, has, has passed, okay? We've got half of the time remaining, 0.5 of the time remaining. Square root of 0 0.5 is 0 0.7, roughly. 
So what I'm saying is half the time passes, we've still got 70% of our premium. Now, if you get to the point where 20, 75% of the time has passed and you've only got 25% of the time remaining, now you've got 0.25 remaining. Square root of 0.25 is 0.5. That's where you've only got half your premium remaining. So you've got to go three quarters of the way into the life of the option before you get half your premium gone. This is what I mean by decay up until that point being less than linear. And if you've got 10% of your time remaining, still got a decent chunk of premium left. Remember, that's 0.1 remaining and roughly a little bit more than 30%, but roughly you still got 30%, 30% of your premium remaining with 10% of the life of the option. This is true whether the option had 60 days to go till expiration, 600 days to go till expiration, six days to go till expiration, or six hours to go until expiration. Everything on this sheet applies to each and every one of those situations. So if you're buying a two-month option and you're buying a two-week option, that two-month option, the shape of that deterioration is going to be the exact same as the shape of the deterioration of the two-week option. So it really is kind of misleading to say, I don't want to buy a two-week option relative to a two-month option because my two-week option is in accelerated time decay. That's not true. Only after three quarters of two weeks being 10 days, only after 7.5 days have passed, will my two-week option be in accelerated decay. It happens quicker. You've got to be on your toes more, obviously, because you, it, it's going to happen faster. But it's all in proportion to the amount of time that you bought. Let's, there's, roughly, there's roughly six hours in a... In a Let's call it six hours in a trading day. Uh, you buy an on-the-money option when the market opens that expires that day. That option is made to decay until one and a half hours is remaining in the trading session. It's all proportionate. I don't know if, I don't know if the word fractal, where everything is... Uh, is a smaller version of, uh, of everything, everything else uh, applies here, but it's all, it's all in proportion to the amount of time you bought. And I think to say that, here's where I think the misunderstanding comes in. Remember I said a two-month option versus a two-week option. I don't want to buy the two-week option, or it's riskier to buy the two-week option because it's in accelerated decay, Okay. It's not that the two-week option is in accelerated decay. The two-month option is in accelerated decay. The two-month option or is, is just about to move into what, two months. Let's, let's call two months ten weeks, okay, roughly, for simplicity's purposes. So two-month option, now that that's only got two weeks to go to expiration, that's in accelerated decay because more than three-quarters of the time has passed till expiration. But that doesn't mean the two-week option is an accelerated decay. That's where I think the distinction, or, or that's the distinction that's made, or that's the uh, mis misinterpretation that's made. This is just an illustration here. Uh, this option is two and a half. Uh, roughly at the point where, let's, let's focus on this. Roughly three-quarters of the time has passed at this point here, and now you're at the point where you're at about half of the original premium. And that's the point at which 
the, ex the, the uh, decay begins to accelerate. You don't have to trade only in the direction of the trend. But it certainly, it certainly can be helpful in terms of the fact that we are dealing with an asset that is decaying and we are looking for a fast, aggressive move in the right direction. And we're not looking to be heroes and turn a battleship around over a relatively short period of time that we're owning an option. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't people in this, in this very audience who are extremely adept at overbought, oversold, picking short-term tops, picking short-term bottoms, and if you are, more power to you. From my perspective, from the way I uh, try to get my uh, uh, trading edge, I'm looking for a trend that's in my favor, and perhaps one of the best opportunities you can have in terms of initiating an option trade, let's say a call, would be a pullback to some kind of defined support level, particularly if it's defined more than one, more than one way, whether it be 50% correction, moving average, support, whatever. A pullback to support within an uptrending environment could be a good time to enter a call position because, again, you're looking for uh, the idea there is the support's going to hold in relatively short order and the uptrend is going to resume. Well, that's what you want in terms of uh, your timing factor as a, as a call buyer. Okay, this is a little, little misleading in terms of there are certainly other things that are options are priced based on. Uh, stock price, uh, stri stock price, uh, strike price, uh, time until expiration, but all things being equal, in an on-the-money situation on a stock that doesn't pay a dividend, the premium of such an option on the money will be in direct proportion to the, the implied volatility. So back to that example where we paid a buck eighty for that option with the stock at fifty, and I said that translated into a 23% implied volatility, if that, stock, if that stock's options were trading at a 46% implied volatility, that option wouldn't be a buck 80, it would be 360. And you know what happens under those circumstances. My break even now goes from 5180 to 5360. My profit on a, on a move to 60 goes from 400% to about half that. I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of negative things that occur when I'm buying a higher implied volatility. And that's going to, I'm getting a little, little bit ahead of myself. I mean, that, that also relates to the question I was raising at the very beginning, that very first question, which was, do I want to buy, uh, am I going to get my biggest profit potential out of options on high volatility stocks. You're paying for it. You're paying for that volatility. And what you're really looking for is getting the maximum directional movement you can out of a stock. You don't particularly care if that stock is more volatile or less volatile during your holding period. Naturally, if it is more volatile, there's more of a chance that it's going to fall out in such a way that you get, a, you get a big move. But essentially, you're paying for volatility. And through the premium of the option you're buying, your payoff is in the directional movement. Your payoff is not in volatility. Your payoff is in directional movement. And the more volatility you pay for, the tougher your break-even hurdle is going to be, and the less leverage you're going to get for a particular percentage move in the stock. Yes, theoretically, the higher volatility stock is going to have a bigger chance of making a bigger move. But all we're saying by that is, OK, it's all priced in 
to the option that you're buying. The volatility factor is priced into the option that you're buying. Nirvana would be if you could, if you have reason to believe uh, that a very low volatility stock is going to make a fast, aggressive move in the right direction. Because then uh, you're going to be getting you're going to be getting extreme leverage because of the, the, the modest option premium that you're going to be paying. Now, uh, the option pricing model. Option pricing model is a statistically based model. It assumes that stock price movement is uh, random and independent, and it also assumes that returns are what is known as log normally distributed. And we'll get to that as we, as we move through here, because it's going to relate to one of the questions I asked at the beginning. Uh, so we're, we're, in a, we're talking about a variability concept, annualized standard deviation, random stock price movement, log normal distribution of returns. This is where we get into the question of the $100 stock being equally likely to be at 150 as it is at 50 after a year. Now, according to the, and there, there's certainly a, a good deal of logic to it, according to the theory underlying the option pricing model, that stock, if it's at 150, the equal move to the downside in terms of probability would put that stock at about 67. If you have a stock that goes from 100 to 200, in other words, double, that would, the probability of that would be roughly equal to the probability of that stock price being cut in half. And that essentially relates to, if you go out on this log curve, it's a, it's a bell-shaped curve, but you're talking about log numbers on the x-axis. And essentially, when you look at it that way, you have two, meaning a double, equally probable with 0.5, which means a 50% a 50 decline. Three, meaning a triple, being equally probable to minus uh, to one-third. Okay, so that, that and it makes sense. I mean, obviously, a, a stock is a, a stock is 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 is, is uh, limited, bounded by zero in terms of how much it can go down, and it's and it's infinite in its capability to go up. And again, as I said before, for on the money options, the option premium levels are directly proportional to the assumed stock volatility, which means that. You got a volatility of about 35% and a volatility, well, didn't carry this out to 70%. But essentially, if you double the volatility assumption, you, you double the premium. Oh, I, I know the problem with this chart was it was, it was done on a stock that pays, that pays a dividend, which uh, mutes things a little bit. And again, I had said that as an option buyer, you're you're paying for volatility, but your payoff is in price direction. You don't, I mean, you don't particularly care how volatile the stock is as long as you reach your, as long as you reach, you reach your price objective. We know that large directional moves can occur with little volatility. They, we, we, we've seen those charts, the steady uptrend, the bars are not particularly big, uh, relatively short-term moving averages tend to define the move. Um, similarly, high volatility can result in little directional price movement. You could have all kinds of crazy intraday volatility and the Dow is up 200, down 200, every which way, but it nets out to very little. Example I like to use, and it, it, it is uh, actually out of date now because of, the, of the, uh, the way volatilities have declined, but 
I say, imagine that you bought uh, a 90-day call option on IBM, and each and every trading day, let's assume IBM is, is uh, $100 a share, uh, each and every trading day, that IBM moves up a quarter of a point. That's all it does. Every monotonous day, it goes up a quarter of a point. Well, when I was originally constructing this, this example, using a 40% implied volatility on IBM, a 90-day call option would have cost you eight points. And if you do the arithmetic, over the course of uh, the number of trading days in a three-month period of time, and you add a quarter and a quarter and a quarter and a quarter each day, you're going to come out, excuse me, you're going to come out with a total of 16 points to the upside. That would put IBM at 116. That would make your 100-strike call option worth 16. You paid eight points for that 100-strike call option, and you've doubled your money over a three-month period with what kind of volatility? I mean, that's obviously an extreme example, but, uh, and we might get bored to tears by it, but we're going to double our money while we're being bored to tears by it. Yes? I don't understand number three, why you prefer little volatility. If you wait until expiration, it should not make any difference. And if it's before expiration, wouldn't the higher volatility... Yeah, this is the, the question is, why, why am I saying in this third bullet point that option buyers want price movement in their forecasted direction, preferably with little volatility. This is misleading in terms of the way it's phrased. What I would really mean to say here is preferably with little implied volatility. In other words, or little expected volatility. Because if there's little expected volatility, your option premium on the get-go is, is, is going to be that much lower. Uh, that's what that's really all about. But, but, but uh, thank you for that. Uh, this, though, where I said quarter point each day, bored to tears, double your money, eight point premium on IBM, 40% implied volatility. Well, you're probably, you're probably talking closer to 20% implied volatility on IBM these days, probably a little bit low. But, but take the example if it was 20% implied volatility, instead of paying eight points for that. 90-day uh, call option, you'd be paying four points for that 90-day call option. And instead of doubling your money from 8 to 16, you got quadruple your investment or a 300% return on that uh, because your, your option goes from four points to a, a value of 16 points. Again, illustrating the power of uh, buying options with, a, with lower implies. This is simply an illustration I'm going back to the mid-90s. Uh, of a volatile market with little net directional price movement. It's the Russell 2000 over the, over the course of uh, the second half of 1994. Big ups, big, big downs. If you bought an option that spanned this time period, you probably would have uh, lost a good chunk of change despite all the intermediate moves. And then as we came out of 94, we moved into an uptrending period where actually the volatility started to compress because it became a low volatility up move as opposed to a high volatility sideways no net price movement situation. This of course being a much more ideal circumstance for buying option premium than uh, the 1994 situation. A lot, of, a lot of the caution associated with tra trading uh, options based on uh, implied volatility refers to, would refer to selling, naked selling of options in particular. Uh, you could have extremely high volatility, high implies on a, on a stock. You might be looking to sell options on that particular stock. Uh, it could be a biotech stock that's about to triple based upon some kind of an FDA approval. It could be an airline stock that's about to go bankrupt. Uh, I guess my point is very often volatilities are, uh, ir seem irrationally high and there's, there's a reason behind it. So buy, uh, seller beware 
in those kinds of situations. Also, we also have to be aware, let's say we're, when we're comparing implied volatilities to historicals and we say, hey, this one is pretty cheap relative to historical volatility. I just want to give you a, a, a specific uh, example on that. Uh, let's say, you're use an extreme example, let's say a stock is trading at, a, uh, options are trading at a 90 implied and historical is 120. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, Netflix on steroids or something, something along those lines. Uh, it's trading at a 90 implied, historicals are 120, cheap relative historicals perhaps, but realize that with a 90% implied, your three month on the money option is gonna sell for an 18% premium. So back to our $50 stock example, we'd be paying nine points to buy that three month call option if the underlying volatility assumption was 90%. So look at that hurdle. Gotta be 59 by expiration in, in, in order to break even. Might be cheap relative to historicals, but the question you have to ask yourself is, do I have a reasonable chance of making money over the holding period on this option when I'm paying 18% of the stock price for three months? I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we, we really did discuss this a little while ago. I was talking about the, uh, uh, the support that can result if there's big put open interest below the market and the, the, the possibility of accelerated rallies. Uh, by trading in the direction of extremely high open interest, in this particular case, in that example, I would be buying puts in that situation. I would be, I would be buying uh, in the same direction as the, as the big open interest was sitting. Now, I could benefit from that. I could benefit from that from the standpoint of if there is one of these accelerated delta hedging type moves below the strike that causes a, a, a spiral to occur as more and more shorting has to occur to, to balance out the short, uh, the short puts. I could benefit from that. On the other hand, that's a, that's a, a relative relatively low, lower probability event than I would like to see. Uh, another advantage, another uh, explanation of saying I don't want to trade in the direction of extremely high open interest, and again, this is complicated much more than it ever has been because of, of all the activity that is seller generated these days. But again, you have the concept of the crowded trade. Let's, let's, think, let's think simplistically and say that that high open interest let's say it's in calls, is buyer generated, uh, the vast majority of it anyway is buyer generated. Basically what, what that's saying is number one, that stock is pre-bought to the extent that that call buying has, has created hedged stock buying. Uh, so a lot of buying is already reflected in that stock, but number two, it's a crowded trade in the sense that a lot of people at that particular point in time for that particular option time period are bullish on that stock. Um, I tend to try to be a little bit more contrarian in my, in, in, in my approach and I'm, I get uncomfortable when I feel like uh, the crowd is kind of playing it in the same, in the same manner as, uh, as I'm looking to play it. One of the pitfalls, uh, particularly uh, of those moving from stock trading to options trading, uh, being able to look at options trading as a probability game, uh, being able to look at options trading as a game where you're going to inevitably suffer losses, uh, the, where the best you can do is try to limit the magnitude of, of your losing trades and try to maximize your opportunities to get those huge profit trades that are, that are, profitable, that are possible uh, being long options. Again, my point about diversifying, that helps to maximize, not only is it a, is it a risk redu reduction factor, but it also helps maxi maximize your 
your possibility of one or two of your positions, if you've got 10, achieving some, some very big profits as opposed to having a single position and having your entire investment capital in that, in that uh, single position. And, and back to, again, here, that battle that I was talking about before, the leverage and convexity that you get from the fast, aggressive move in the right direction and the uh, slow death that you die uh, if you're not getting your move and you're, and you're holding that option until expiration. Uh, too little diversification is, is, is a major pitfall. Buying too little time is a major pitfall. Uh, for many of us, it would be best uh, to take to count to 10 and uh, add an expiration month to the expiration month that we were thinking of trading. Uh, buying too little delta is also uh, a major pitfall. Uh, for many of us, uh, it would be best to move a strike down after counting to 10, let's say, in a, in, in a call option buying situation. There it is. Diversification, insufficient time, too far out of the money. What do I mean by time stops? Um, back to, well, first of all, you buy an option, you put a stop, you put a stop in 20% below your, your, your entry price. I mean, one, one of the things you're, go you're going to find is you're going to get taken out by intraday volatility so frequently. Uh, at the end of the day, let, let's say you're not tracking the market that day and uh, your stock was 100, closed on 100 the day before and it closes at 100 and a half the next day and you had your stop in and you weren't tracking the market and you say, okay, yeah. stock was up a half and very often you'll also notice that you're out of your position because the stock dipped uh, to 98 sometime uh, uh, in the middle of the trading session. So uh, getting taken out by volatility is, 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 is something you really don't want to do if, it, if, it's, if it's a situation where you're, you're losing 10 or 20 percent on your option. I mean, let's, to some extent, we, we have to be big boys and girls in terms of the fact that we're going for these big gains. And if we're going to be too nervous about losing 20, 25, 30 uh, percent, perhaps that's not the game that we should be in, simply because you have to, you have, to have some expanded risk tolerance to uh, give, keep yourself in the game enough to be able to, be able to make the big profits. What I, what I like about this, the time stop, co time stop concept, and it, it would be simply something like this. Uh, we know that, for example, when about uh, half the time passes, we have about 70% of our option premium. Again, assuming the stock price is constant, because it helps us visualize this whole thing. Uh, if I buy that 50 strike call at $1.80, and uh, half the time, 30 days has passed, the stock is still 50. I've still got, out of that $1.80, I've probably got about $1.25 in premium remaining. And it would be reasonable at that point for many of us to say, hey, I bought a 60-day option. I was looking for a fast, aggressive move in the right direction. 30 days has passed. The stock has not moved. Obviously, what I was looking for at the time I put on that trade has not come to pass. I can either pray that it's going to happen in the next 30 days, and if it doesn't, I'm going to lose my buck and a quarter, or I could say, look, it should have happened in 30 days because I'm buying a 60-day option. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not expecting it to happen two days before expiration. That's cutting it a little bit too close. It didn't happen. I'm going to take my 30% loss and move on. I mean, you could even do it. Obviously, you're risking more and more as you, as you move closer to expiration. You're risking the stock moving so far away that you've, you've, you've got nothing left. But again, we're using that example where the stock stays at the strike. You can go three quarters of the way till expiration with the 60 day. Let's say you go to 15 days left until expiration. Again, if the stock has not moved, out of my buck 80, I've got 90 cents left. 
remember three quarters of the way, 25% of the time left, I've got half my premium left. I've got 90 cents now. Okay, now I bought a 60-day option. I was expecting a fast, aggressive move in the right direction. 45 out of my 60 days is gone. I've got half my money still. It might be a reasonable thing at that point to decide. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close out my trade and move on. I want to mention two things about spreading your exposure over, over uh, puts and calls. Um, one is kind of a, a, a common uh, advantage that's discussed about buying puts relative to short selling in terms of the fact that uh, short selling has that theoretically unlimited uh, potential loss and uh, put buying, you're back in the mode of being long an option, which means that your loss is defined as being no greater than the premium that you paid, and uh, you've got the leverage and, and, and convexity going for you. But uh, more specifically, let's say you have a portfolio of 10 options. Uh, it may not require more than two puts out of that 10, two puts and eight calls. Those two puts, in the event of a major market accident to the downside, could be more than enough to not only offset your loss in the eight calls, but give you possibly a pretty decent profit to boot. Simply because if you had uh, a market uh, semi-meltdown kind of a situation, uh, not only would you get the big move in your direction, but also the implied volatilities would, would tend to soar. That would benefit you not only on the put side, but your call options that you own will, will have some premium uh, associated with them because the implies have gone up. So it doesn't take much in the way of put exposure to uh, kind of crash-proof a, uh, a portfolio of calls because of the leverage and and convexity factors. And basically we know what the uh, what the parameters are on the puts. It's uh, flip it over and our big profit is on the declines in the stock and we lose our maximum full premium if the stock is at or above the strike at expiration. And of course that arrow does not actually go to infinity and beyond like it does on the call side because we know the stock is not going to go below zero. Final, final point I want to make, and this is there is nothing uh, mathematically rigorous at all about what I'm about to describe. It's, it's, it's much more from a, from a psychological standpoint. It's a, it's a, it's a way I use to kind of trick myself into uh, uh, doing the right thing with my positions. And that is, uh, I mean, we, we, we know that we want to achieve those 10 bagger type trades question is, how do we keep ourselves in the game psychologically? How do we keep ourselves clear-headed in, in, in those kinds of circumstances? And I find that my best way of doing it is to take something off the table at a certain predefined point in time and then get very aggressive with what I have left. And essentially, what I will do, and we're back to that example of the uh, $1.80 option, Let's say I bought 10 contracts at $1.80 per contract, cost me 1800 bucks. I get a double. I have $360 premium, uh, $360 contracts. Now I had $180 contracts to begin with. I close out five contracts. I've got my original $1,800 back. And now I'm playing with their money, so to speak. This is, uh, and, I, I, and I personally, and we're all different, I personally would be 
pretty comfortable in being pretty darn aggressive with that, the remainder of that position. Now, if it went to five times my original investment, I probably wouldn't be able to resist taking a couple more with three more contracts off the table. But then with what remains there, I mean, you couldn't shake me out of that position. I don't care what, what happened in the market, you couldn't shake me out of that position. Now, maybe there are some of us, some of us out here who could just sit, sit there with their arms folded and get a double and triple and five tuple and ten tuple and still be sitting with those, sitting with those ten contracts. And if you can do that, you are absolutely ideally suited to option trading as long as you also have uh, practice uh, discipline and, and control on the law side. Uh, I find that if I let the cash register ring a little bit such that I, I can get my original investment back, uh, I'm much more clear-headed uh, with, uh, with the rest of the trade. So with that, that concludes the presentation, and that's where we are. Thank you very much. Bernie Schaefer invites you to take a risk-free 60-day trial of his master portfolio. Look over the master's shoulder as he buys and sells stock in his own portfolio. Get email notification of every trade he makes. Call 1-800-448-2080 or visit his special web address today and sign on. Thank you for viewing this seminar, which is part of Schaefer's Education Series. If there's anything Bernie or his team can do to assist you, please call right away.